so Ro, <clears throat> um, you've written a few books, but we wanted to hear from you specifically about coaching self-organizing teams. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, uh, what I'd, I think what I'd like to do just by way of the time that we have with you is not get you effectively to give a precy and a short version of the book, but just to hear a little bit more about the context for why it matters as a subject matter. Probably a little bit of a double click on one or two terms um, because they will be new to some people. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe just a little about you. So if, if you don't mind, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to just read a couple of things about your bio, just a couple of bullet points, and sure. uh, and let you launch off from there so we can hear more about Ro Gorel before we before we talk specifically about um, coaching self-organizing teams. Fantastic. Sound good? Go yeah, go for it. Okay, good stuff. Um, I love this. In 1982, you finished a program on Greek and Roman studies. Um, and uh, we could have this whole conversation about uh, the, you know, the connections of modern day leadership to uh, the great, uh, the lives of, you know, Plutarch and the great uh, Greeks and Romans. Um, Post-grad diploma in, in HR management, HR roles at ICL Mercury, um, a master's in law and employment relations. Um, then head of business improvement and quality at Siemens and now uh, focus in coaching from uh, Global Team Coaching Institute and the Coaching Academy. So if I can just turn it over to you, can you give a few more words about the, the author? <laughs> the author, so yeah, so I'm glad, <laughs> you, um, I'm glad you mentioned my classics training, which mm. um, I think nowadays arts degrees come under a bit of um, scrutiny and people wonder why would you do an arts degree? And I actually think that my degree is probably really important because it teaches you critical thinking. And yeah. one of the things that I'm noticing is that particularly leaders find it challenging to do that critical thinking. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. One is that they've got multiple stakeholders that they have to satisfy. Um, and I think the second thing is that the pace of life as you know, technology is, has accelerated the pace at which we have to make decisions. And so you don't get that opportunity to do the critical thinking um mm. that maybe you you ought to be doing so for me i i used to feel very embarrassed about having done a classics degree but now i own it and i'm very proud of having done a classics degree <laughs> and that kind of if you think about that as well it kind of i think started my interest in coaching because obviously the great philosophers socrates in particular was the one that i that um triggered the sort of the coaching gene uh, because he asked questions you know and he asks yeah. what seem to be dumb questions but actually they challenge your thinking in a way that perhaps you don't realize because the simplicity fools you um and obviously it didn't do much good in the end because he was uh, <laughs> he was required to drink hemlock for corrupting the athenian youth um but uh, they got him yeah, they did. They did. So, uh, so thinking maybe isn't such a good thing. But the questioning, you know, <laughs> questioning style is is really important when you're you're coaching and also listening. So, I think that's probably where that sort of gene came from in in the coaching sphere. And and having worked with lots of different organisations as well, um, you just obviously you you become a keen observer of human behaviour when you coach. It's just wired into you. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's been an interesting few years, and I think the the pandemic has has highlighted some of the challenges that we have in the way that we work together, both in organisations nationally and globally. Um, and maybe we could actually do with a bit more teamwork internationally. Right. Yeah. Just as you were talking about Socrates meeting a poor end, um, our team recently finished. Uh, Boethius, the Constellation of Philosophy. He also met a poor end, and so did Seneca, who we who we were reading last year. All, but uh, arguably, the uh, the fools who who worked out the demise of those three great men of history really, uh, I think, kind of they, the the great men got the last laugh. Let's say. 
Definitely. Because history Definitely. has remembered those folks as uh, as uh, cowards. Yes. Yep. For sure. Yeah. Um, can you can we go straight into self organizing teams? I just know yep. everybody's going to double click there and be like, "What do you mean self organizing?" So can I just can I just ask you a two word question? Self organizing question mark. <laughs> yes. So self organizing it again. Um, there there is no. Um, succinct answer to this because it depends what you mean by self-organizing do you mean completely um autonomous self-directed um can do what they want to through to you've created some boundaries around what is okay for the team to do and not to do so it's a it's a continuum the core concept is that the team has a level of autonomy to direct themselves in terms of their work and how they do the work um, and obviously, at the moment, in organizations that are adopting agile practices, self-organizing teams form part of the principles of the Agile Manifesto. Um, and so, yeah, so self-organizing basically means you've got some degree of autonomy for how you organize yourself as a team. That degree depends on what the organization wants to do. You know, there are some organizations like Hire, where, which is a Chinese white goods manufacturing company, where they got they created in effect small entrepreneurial units so they are completely responsible for their own direction and, and destiny um, and then you've got other organizations who you know set the boundaries for what the team is doing and they create you know the budgets and so on and then the team can work within those boundaries so you kind of got both end of the spectrum really so so Ro why are you putting your focus and your time there uh, as opposed to say, let's say, call it the conventional team, the team where they they have not a whole lot of autonomy and they really need to do what has been given to them, delegated to them. Yeah. So I think obviously there is a, a, a time and place for everything. Um, so if you think about the context, so context is really important when it comes to teams. So I think a lot of people, you know, jump on a bandwagon and think, oh, yeah, we'll do that in our organization. But you need to understand what is the context for the team. So if you're in a crisis, then having a completely self-organizing team who can decide what they do, when they do it, how they do it, regardless of anything else that's going on, probably wouldn't be a good idea. Because, you know, in yeah. a crisis, there is something you need to do, particularly if it's, you know, if you're working in a crew in a, in a fire emergency team. Obviously, the team has some level of self-direction, but they have <laughs> some rules and boundaries that they work within because they need to do that. Otherwise, it's going to end up with somebody getting injured and, and possibly die. So yes. I think you need to first of all understand the context for what self-organizing team you're actually trying to create. And then that will determine the level of, of, of autonomy and direction that the team can set. So, for example, one of the case studies I, I talk about in the book is Boetzorg, which is a, a Netherlands um, independent living organization that supports people living independently in the community. Um, and they've again created some boundaries around how the team operates, but outside of those boundaries, the team creates their own little neighborhood units. Um, mm. So I think there are always going to be some boundaries because you know, if you have no boundaries and chaos ensues, so you've still got to have some guardrails, but it's the degree of the guardrails that you put in place. And that context right. is really, really important. And I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning, that critical thinking for leaders. When you as an organization are thinking, oh, there's this newfangled thing called Agile, which means we're going to have self-organizing teams. Mm -hmm. Stop, <laughs> pause, reflect. What is our organization trying to achieve by doing this? What is the benefit that we think will ensue from having self-organizing teams? What does it right. mean for the system that we have currently in place? And how will we manage the transition to, from what we have currently to moving into the direction of self-organizing teams? So these are huge questions um, that, you know, for the team coach, they sit outside of our domain our role is to help the organization understand to ask those questions and just be mindful of what is it you're actually trying to do with self-organizing teams. So I want to get that message across because I don't want people taking the book and going, oh yeah, let's create a self-organizing team. You've got to understand the context. 
Um, <clears throat> can I ask you to just hold the book cover up? Because some we know from our experience that some people will, yeah, they'll track um, that in particular. Great. And then Ro, Ro Gorel. I mean, we'll we'll stick the link and, and so on in the in the uh, captions. But um, I kind of want to ask, you know, I I, th I think when when leaders or candidate leaders, people who will start to consider a range of topics that your book brings up, uh, encounter your ideas, there's going to be a, uh, it's gonna be challenging for them to let go of certain ways of already doing things. And I just to sort of pitch their case for them to take their side and advocate for, for not letting go, um, there can be a lot at stake in in changing something that might be working okay or good enough. Uh, and so the idea of moving towards self-direction in, in the way a team is configured, the idea of, of taking on a, stylistically what is, um, like you said, either an agile posture or even a coaching style, if that isn't something you've been accustomed to, um, we maybe can't overstate the fact that that's a big big sea change yeah it is so what what do you recommend i mean i know you you see folks like this in your regular practice but they're also going to be your readership here um what do you recommend for sort of evaluating whether or not to take a leap like you're implying people take so can i answer that in two parts so yeah it was kind of a five-part question so a, a two-part yeah. answer would be actually actually getting some economy out of it <laughs> so, um, so the, the first thing is to say that um, when you coach the team in, in a self-organizing team you also have to think about the leadership of that team as well because it still needs leadership you know the organizations that I've spoken with and read about they still have leaders in the organization so our role as coach isn't just to coach the team it's also to help the team leader because they will need to consider those very questions that you, you've asked. You know, what, yeah. what are the implications for me as a leader? What does it mean about my leadership style? How might I be challenged as a leader? What, what do I feel about that? You know, asking those kind of questions, because I think often in organizations, we don't ask that feeling question enough. And we know that emotions dictate how we make decisions. So understanding what what's the emotion sitting behind that what do you think that emotion is about really um, yeah. and I'm yeah. picking some of that with the leader to help them you know it's about supporting them in this journey as well so that's the first thing and the second thing is really getting clear on what is the purpose behind why you want to go in that direction anyway because if you're not really clear what the purpose is and how it fits into your overall strategy as a business then really, you know, you need to go back to the drawing board because without that, you're, you're basically just, you're putting something into the organization without really understanding why. And that's the first question that the team wants to understand is what are we doing here together? What's our purpose as a team? What are we trying to achieve together that we, we can't achieve apart? That's what you're really trying to address. And so at an organizational level, they have to be clear of that as well. When you encounter teams, how often do you discover that there's a couple of people within a team that are, are, are nearly there already, or they're already there in terms of a, a clarity as to the why question? Well, that's interesting in itself because it's a collective um, purpose. So everybody needs to be clear. Um, so if there's a couple of people clear, then you obviously you want to understand what is it they're clear about? Does it help the team? get a better understanding of, of what the purpose is overall. And does everybody feel aligned around that purpose? So if you, you know, I'm a huge fan of Ted Lasso and um, it's a comedy program that's on Apple TV. And I, and if you want to understand team coaching, I would definitely recommend it. It's a masterclass in team okay. coaching. And right. um, <laughs> he talks about the star players. So in this scenario, the star <laughs> player is somebody who's got absolute clarity on the purpose um, but if they go on the pitch with that clarity of purpose, but the rest of the teammates don't understand what they're meant to be doing, he'll take charge of the ball or she'll take charge of the ball, go to the goal. And then 
the whole team is thinking, well, what are we here to do? So you've got to have all of the team players on the same side, working in the same direction, understanding where the goal is. Um, Because if you don't, then it's not a team. (laughs) It's one of the fundamental questions of a team. What is our purpose? What are we here to do? Right. So, so the character that I was sort of envisioning, the, the one who just has the, the prescience and the clarity about where we're all going is the equivalent of just like one, one defender who knows exactly how they're supposed to play on their side. And then a yeah. bunch of uh, other uh, zombies walking around, which is not yeah. a team. No, no. And at the end of the day, you know, just mm-hmm. the, the sporting analogy that is in the Ted Lasso program is brilliant because it just demonstrates that if you've got somebody who's, you know, charging ahead and thinks they've got the answer, you, you're not actually going to succeed as a team. And in fact, it's going to be to your detriment. Um, and often, I've seen that often in organizations where you've got the, the the maverick or the lone wolf who's really good, or, you know, the star player is really, really good at what they do. Um, but then they're not good at team skills. And team skills are a skill. They're things that you learn. You you're not necessarily going to have them from day one. And that's the whole point of the coaching experience, that it teaches you how to work collectively together so that you leverage that rather than just having individuals going off doing their own thing. I want to tie two things together. You started, we started with critical thinking Mm. and there's uh, classically, I, I did a logic degree. Ah, okay. As my, as my first degree. So, uh, and, and I read the classics nowadays, as I was alluding to, uh, for our work. But uh, there's this this whole business of argument by analogy. And you you were just saying, which is so true, that warfare and sports, sports was what you picked up, mm-hmm. seem to offer us powerful analogs. Mm-hmm. And there's two words that are throughout your writing and even in this conversation already, which are team and coach, which are clearly, if they aren't directly borrowed from the sporting world, um, they have very strong overlap to the sporting world. <clears throat> um, and yet, uh, there's a question. There's a question in this row. And yeah, and no, yet, I'm, um, I'm, I'm really thinking through what you're saying, and I've got some thoughts. But carry on. <laughs> yeah. Good. 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 Um, I guess one of the great challenges we face as we talk to thinkers and authors about words like leadership, management, coaching, mentoring, mm-hmm. those those words in particular, but others like them, is that there's a lot of ambiguity. And so what it, what is meant by coach in one environment is different than another, even from one even from one author to another. Mm-hmm. and and that can be true for another word like team. Mm-hmm and so on. So can I just throw that bundle of thoughts to you and just kind of let you respond, even though I realize I haven't sort of put it forward as a, as a sharpened question? That's fine, because <clears throat> the, the, the way the brain works is that we'll, we'll be making stuff up in our heads as we're listening to stuff anyway. That's just I, I, could, I, could, I could see <laughs> the gears turning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, so first of all, just I want to pick up on the analogy um, comment and talk about the power of story. So if, if you think about it, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to the classics again. Apologies for anybody who isn't interested in the classics, but Homer, the great alleged author, and we won't go into the, the, the um, academic stuff around that, but let's just assume Homer was an author from ancient times and he wrote these two great stories, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And of course, that is all based on oral tradition of stories being shared through the generations. Um, And so the brain, the way the brain processes information is we we create stories in our head. So being able to use analogy is a really good way of helping people understand um, and, and, and create their own meaning and also provides an opportunity for the team to have a conversation about what meaning did you take from that story versus what meaning did I take from that story? And, huh, what does that mean for us as a team then? If we've all got, because essentially what you're doing there is getting different perspectives. And obviously when you're working with stakeholders, you've always got different perspectives. So using a story to demonstrate how stakeholder perspectives um, come into what you do as a team is a really great way of, of doing things. So that's the first thing that I picked up from, from what you said there. 
The second thing around team, the words team and coach, I agree. They, you know, even among the coaching fraternity, what one coach considers to be good practice for coaching, another coach would consider something else to be good practice. Obviously, yeah. we have our standards, you know, we've got all sorts of different um, institutions out there that have standards, you know, the International Coaching Federation, European Mentoring Coaching Council, the UK, the Association for Coaching. They've all come up with their standards of what coaching is. However, coaching is very, I'll go back to what I said before, context determines what you do. So what one coach does in one context, another coach might do something completely different, but within those guardrails of generally accepted principles of coaching, they will be practicing their craft. Um, and it's likely to be not directive. So it's likely not to be in content. Um, mm -hmm. And it's likely to be around creating an opportunity for the client to create their own answers. They're right. the kind of generalized principles mm -hmm. of what coaching is. So it's not going in providing advice. It's not going in telling people what to do. It's not going in using your expertise to guide yeah. the team. That's yes. generally not what we mean by coaching. However, in a team coaching environment, you might do little bits of that because you're working in a complex adaptive system. So there might be times when you have to be more inputting on content. If you've got a, some expertise in the topic, you might be inputting on content a little yes. bit. You always leave the team capable of choosing their own answer though. Once you start to direct where the team goes and telling them what the answer should be, then you've definitely moved out of coaching the team collectively always takes responsibility for its own answers and solutions. So that's a little bit on coaching. And then team, there's been, you know, when I was researching the book, I could not believe how much research there was around what do we mean by team? You think something mm -hmm. as simple as that would be easy to define. There were, you know, lots of different nuances of what do we mean by team? lots of different research that backed up one approach or research that backed up another approach. I would go back to the three things that came out loud and clear, which I quote in the book, which is Michael West, which is, do you have an objective? Do you need to work together, um, you know, in an interrelated way to, to create an outcome? And is it clear what it is the team is actually there to do? Um, so that's, that's how I would define a team, but with the caveat that there are various nuances of what we mean by a team. But if, mm. if ultimately, if there's no reason for the team, the people to be working together as a team, i.e. they could go off and do it individually and it wouldn't impact the output, then it's probably not a team. It's probably just a group of individuals working together. Hopefully that gave some insight <laughs> in a very short no, answer. No, ab absolutely, absolutely. So in your experience, say, say a coach is meant to be coaching a team and it, com it comes to light through their, the line of their questioning or their time with those folks. This is not a team. This is a group of individuals that happens to work together. Um, what does that mean? What does that mean for that group of individuals? What does it mean for the coaching relationship? So that would be exactly the question that I'd ask. So you would put it back to the, the people in the room. So we've now had this insight, realization. What, what does that mean for the people in this room? What do you want to do with that information? And if they want to actively work together as a team, then you can say, okay, well, how would we create meaning for you working together? As a, how would you create meaning for working together as a team? What, mm -hmm. would, what would need to happen to move you from working together as a group to working together as a team. So you would, you're always coaching. You, you never, you would never sort of as a coach say, okay, well, in that case, there's no point working together and coaching because ultimately the team decides or the group decides in that case, do you want yeah. to carry on? Yes or no. We're well, having had this conversation. What do you want to do with that? If you want to carry on, great. Let's work out how we're going to do that. If you don't want yeah. to carry on, that's great as well. What do you need to do to make sure that you gracefully exit from what we've been doing? Would be how I would uh, approach that. Okay, then then there's another question that I don't feel like this is this is down the center lane of your book, but I still want to ask you just because I've got I've got you yeah. now. 
Um, in a coaching engagement, how do you know when it's over? It's, that's a really interesting question because it applies both to individual coaching one-on-one -on -one and also team coaching. So team coaching, you know, because you, you can hear and see the team coaching themselves. So I sat in one team and, and in one of the sessions, I literally was just punctuating the conversation here, there and everywhere because they were coaching each other. And it's kind of, you know, my work here is done because they, they'd worked out how to coach together in that environment. So for me, it would be, I would be listening for what, what sort of things are they asking each other? How are they asking the questions? How are they reflecting? Are they taking time to, to reflect? Um, it would be observing who is doing what in, you know, is somebody taking charge or are they collectively um, working together? So you, mm -hmm. you, you, you kind of have indicators and then ultimately you ask the team, what do they want to do? You know, I'm noticing that you, you're now doing these things, you know, you're asking great questions, you're taking time to reflect, you're doing all the coaching practice stuff that we've talked about, you know, is now the time to actually go on your own? What do you want to do? Um, mm -hmm. You know, we said we would work together for this many sessions. It now seems that which you're transitioning to being your own coaching team. What do you want to do? And then they will tell you because you've got two contracts. You've got the, the physical contract that you have with the organization. If you're going in as an external coach and then you've got the contract with the team and the team really determines how long you coach them for. Not not the physical legal contract. That's just something that you've got there. Um, right. you need to have that uh, and obviously if you're earning your money earning your income from that clearly you need to have that but you know yeah. as, a, as a coach you've always got to be open to the fact that you know that coaching assignment may not last for as long as you've got the physical contract um, and I think you know just to get back to our old friend um, philosophy and ethics there is an ethical question there as well you know should you as the coach carry on coaching the team just because you've got that legal contract in place or should right. you recontract um, and say look the team has now come let's let's maybe come back in a few months time and do a review and then see where the team wants to go after that in um in another field which we have um some house expertise in um in b2b business development and sales particularly for professional services. So now I'm thinking consulting, law, accounting, uh, finance. Um, <clears throat> you virtually always do better to say, I think we're done here. I don't think there's anything else that you need. Is there? It just is, it just is such a high integrity play uh, when there will always be a bit of a lingering suspicion like, oh no, I know these folks are going to come along and it's going to be like this consulting gig leads into another, leads into another. And there's whole schools of B2B sales that actually lead that way. <clears throat> and the clients, if you're doing anything like a decent job, they will, they will find plenty more for you to do yeah, for them. Absolutely. It may not be immediate, but mm -hmm. it is the high integrity and, and long-term maneuver to just say, you don't need me. Yeah. You don't yeah. need to see me next week or the week after. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So to, to, I would love to hear that from, from a coach as opposed to, well, I think, you know, there's six sessions left. So why don't we, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if I can take kind of a perpendicular turn, I wanted to make sure we gave plenty of space to conflict because conflict gets um, a variety of, of uh, it gets treated in a variety of ways from you and I'm also picking off row from your your block of six questions in which there's a few different notes on conflict so if, can I just lay the table open on conflict why okay. you have to consider conflict yeah when you're writing thinking or in your reader's case reading about something like coaching self-organizing teams why it's so central you have to know this see it coming have a couple of maneuvers around it. Yep, yep. 
So how many relationships are you in roughly? You know, family, friends, partner, how, how many do you reckon? Uh, you're talking about direct, like close relationships, not yeah. acquaintances, yeah. right? Well, yes. I'd, yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd rough it out at um, 35. Yeah. Yeah. And do those relationships always go smoothly? No. No. <laughs> so why is it that when we... I mean, end I mean, let me get it. Let me just go on the record, bro. It's not like they routinely go badly. <laughs> well, conflict is just it it doesn't mean it's bad it's conflict is what happens when you have a difference that's what conflict means yeah. um and so why is it that when we enter an organization we automatically think that because we're in an organization it's a business conflict won't exist yeah. we're actually yeah. human beings and organizations are really a microcosm of what society is at large if you think about what actually happens in organizations. It's, it's just like, you know, your normal relationships outside of work. There are people that you're going to get along with. There are people that you're not going to get along with. There are going to be yeah. situations yeah. where you have massive differences of opinion, um, where you have beliefs about stuff that are completely polar opposites. Those mm -hmm. things are already present in the workplace. Therefore, to ignore them is not only um, simplistic, it's also dangerous because if you ignore a, the potential for conflict, you not only do you um, deny the fact that you might have diversity and richness of thinking, you also ex expect that people will never disagree. And therefore, that means people don't speak up and give different opinions and perspectives and viewpoints. So mm -hmm. you're kind of stifling the organization if you think of, of conflict as a negative, it's not a negative. It merely is a difference of opinion. When it becomes a negative it is when it is unaddressed. So one of the models that I wanted to use and was, I had to do a bit of German translating. Um, so I'm hoping I got my translation right, um, was the, the Glazel model of, of um, what happens when conflict escalates. You know, if, if you leave it unchecked, then essentially, and I don't wish to be political, but you end up with warfare. And that's what we can see at the moment in, in global terms, what's happened, um, that things have escalated and we're now in open warfare. And that happens in organisations too. You know, you have one business unit arguing with another business unit and then they start to do um, things that undermine each other, um, which ultimately are not for the good of the organisation. So as a coach, we have to be open and aware of that and also willing to enter the domain of conflict and recognize that when a team is having a disagreement, what, we, what we're hopefully going to help the team do is have that as a positive and fruitful disagreement rather than a destructive and unpleasant situation, which is usually what happens in organizations. Do you consider a team of, I'm just trying to think, you consider a team of, of four, that's a, that's a smallish team, mm -hmm. but that's um, six separate pairings. If you have four people, there's six, there's six separate one-to-one -one connections that could be, could be um, happening there. That's a lot of different places to try to navigate as a coach. I mean, that's a, it, that's a very small team. And already you've got a lot of different uh, permutations to yeah. where, where conflict can, can crop up. So, I mean, obviously people should just read the book and then, <laughs> and then get your thoughts. But can you give us a couple of thoughts now on that, you know, snake, snake charming, co cobra charming uh, task of walking into a team and being like, I know what, let's talk about conflict. Um, how, how does a coach... As a coach, not get bitten. Yeah. So um, I've, while charming snakes. Yes. So so first of all, just to put the record straight, the coach is not a magician. <laughs> Even though I know one of my clients did say, "What you do is magic." We're not magicians, and we are both separate from and part of the system that, that we're coaching in. So yes. you know, we, we there will be times when we become heavily invested in what's going on, and our role as a coach is to try what I call and stay in that ego-free zone where you're not attached to any outcome. 
And the second thing I would say is that often when people think of teams and conflict, they think of that interrelational um, conflict. And often it's not actually that that's causing the conflict, it's something else. And so I am going to re refer people to figure 4.1 in my book on page 64, um, which is the sources of conflict. And I talk about things like the status, you know, how does that person feel in the team? How, you know, do they feel that they're valued? Do they feel that they have an equal voice in the team? Is there something going on about how status is experienced in the team? The second thing is around task. Is it that people aren't actually clear on the task and that in itself is causing conflict? And one team I worked with a couple of years ago, it, nobody really knew what they were meant to be doing. So, of course, that created frustration because they were trying to work out what are we meant to be doing? And then they each had different perspectives, but actually they weren't really clear on what it was they're actually trying to achieve. You've then got a process, you know, is the process, have we got a process that we're following here? Is the process, does it make sense? Um, is it fair to everybody in the team? Is it, does it feel fair? Um, mm. And then the final one is that relationship, you know, and I would come back to that one-on-one -on -one comment that you made is that relationship that you have with your colleague is it detrimental to the team yes or no if it's about just you and your colleague you're having a bit of a spat then go and sort it out outside the team if it's actually impacting the team then we as a team need to address it and so that is when collectively you would look to work out okay well what's going on here T really is it you know the system that we've created as a team is that impacting how you two people are able to relate to each other or is it something else? So really it all comes back to what is the impact on the team? If it's not impacting the team, it's actually about that individual stuff, then that needs to be resolved outside of the team environment. So hopefully yeah. that helps. What about team to team conflict or like team to yeah. mothership, team to mother yeah. organization? Yeah. So that, that is really, really um, prevalent in a lot of organizations. And you get that a lot where you have siloed thinking or silos in organizations. Um, and so complete uh, transparency here. I'm a great fan of Dave Snowden, who is uh, the author of the Kinevin Framework, which looks at complexity. How do we make sense of complexity um, in, in the world and the world of work? And what he talks about with some of the techniques that he uses, which I think are brilliant, is he actually says that instead of talking through, you know, oh, what's going on here, blah, 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 you actually get people to do stuff. So, you know, the two teams that are in conflict or two or three or what, however many teams are in conflict, what is it you can actually do together that will create that purpose for working together? So what a task that everybody can work on that is in service of the client or other stakeholder that you're, you're serving. So getting people to action, getting them to do meaningful stuff collectively from the different teams is a great way of helping sort of move away some, from some of that relationship stuff, which is the easy avenue that we go down more into, okay, what is it we're actually really trying to achieve together as an organization? And how can we do that team, team on team to actually deliver that to our clients. So that's probably the way I would go there rather than talking and talking stuff through because we're not group therapists. We're, organizations aren't employing coaches as group therapists. So let's move it away from that. Let's get it more into that. What are the team actually here to do? It's business related. What are the business problems that that is creating having those teams not being able to work together team on team? Mm -hmm. What's your advice to folks who, um, what's your advice to folks about a, a engaging people externally rather than trying to cultivate coaching skills internally? Um, so now we're talking about my, my other book, which I co-authored with Gillian Jones on how to create a coaching culture. I think, again, it goes right back to that purpose. What is it you're actually trying to do with coaching? I, do you, you know, as your plan strategy do you actually want to create coaches internally um if so what is the reason for doing that so i would always go back to that purpose and i'm you know i'm banging on about this but that's because i see it often 
where organizations don't have that really clear up front. So you need to be really mm -hmm. clear up front mm -hmm. why you're doing it. And then once you're clear, that will then determine, okay, well, we know that if we, if our plan is to actually create a coaching organization where coaching skills are the norm, then of course, we're going to have to train people in coaching skills. Therefore, mm -hmm. your strategy would be to develop um, coaches in the organization. And you, you know, part of that probably would be that you would have people coming in as external coaches to act both as co-coaches and potentially mentors to the people who are learning the coaching skills so I think it depends on why you're doing it and then that will determine what approach you take in terms of how you achieve it there's obviously always benefit in getting an external viewpoint because you get that different perspective um, right. provided it fits into that wider plan of, of why you're doing something I'd also say there's been a theme in in our conversations with authors whose writing touches coaching that you certainly don't need subject matter expertise to be a coach, um, but that it can help. It can help give precision to the line of questioning. It can help give uh, a, a short of hand in, in terms of the communications. But um, sometimes that that overt lack of context can really be just a beautiful gift so somebody can ask questions that seem dumb or naive, um, or they can force people who are used to, you know, drinking their own Kool-Aid to make it completely accessible in the way they talk about it, the way they present it. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there is an outsider advantage. Um, de depending on when I think about our, our community, the folks that we work with, build mm. academies for, uh, speak with all the time. Coaching is totally foreign. Nobody in the organization does it. Nobody's ever hired one. They don't have one personally. They don't have one as an organization. Uh, all the way to the other end of the spectrum where it's like full-time employees have had coaching professions in the, in the past. They're fully, you know, there's multiple coaches connecting with the organization at multiple yeah. levels, individual team, strategy coaches, specialist coaches. So you get that huge mm -hmm. spectrum of comfort and familiarity. Um, I wanna speak to the folks who, who haven't gone down this way. It can actually be a uh, uh, quite an intimate undertaking. You think like, oh, we're gonna lay ourselves bare. We're gonna use up a bunch of time. We're gonna spend money on this. Um, who's even got the time for this? Maybe it's gonna be a disaster. Um, how do you, how would you recommend let's say leadership in an organization thinking about bringing a coach into their milieu, what's the ways that they evaluate either that decision or the coach them, themselves when they say, okay, let's get a coach, mm. um, say for one of our teams. Mm. What's the rubric? How do you evaluate a, a coach given, given the significance of that choice? Mm. So, can I answer one of the other questions that was sort of floating in there as well, yeah. um, which was around, you know, that question, are we going to have to lay ourselves bare? Um, and we don't have time to do this. So, you know, and again, I'm biased because <laughs> we've written about this. I would say start small with coaching. So, you know, before you decide whether or not that's something you want to spend time and money on, have a go with it. You know, we've, we've got loads of tools in, in our book, 50 Top Tools for Coaching, and one of them is Coffee Break Coaching. And it's a really mm -hmm. simple tool. It's this, you don't have to lay yourself bare. It's literally very transactional coaching stuff. Um, you know, what, what are you trying to achieve? What have you done so far? What are all the things that you think you could do, blah, blah, blah. And it's just a very simple flow chart. And I've done it with um, seminars, quite a few times and people like it because it is so easy to use and it is very practical you go away with okay right these are my actions I'm going to be doing so that's very transactional coaching and I would say before you do anything on coaching have an experience you know when I worked in Siemens what I did there was I actually asked one of the directors to um, have a coaching experience because I knew that you know introducing coaching straight off the bat yeah, I, and I'm not going to tell you what kind of um, responses I got, but I knew it was going to be challenging and I knew that it was going to be because, you you know, 
you're potentially laying yourself open and vulnerable. So mm-hmm. get a volunteer to go through the process and get them to talk to their peers. There's no point getting a coaching coming to tell you about it because they haven't got credibility with, you know, particularly the exec team. They haven't got credibility with the exec team. They don't know you from a bar of soap. Um, get the exec team to actually have a coaching experience and get them to talk to their colleagues about right. what the benefits were and, and what the experience was like. And do it small, you know, use simple tools that give an experience of it rather than talking conceptually about what coaching is. Because I've done this, you know, when you, you, you're a coach, you love your subject, you're passionate about it, you want to tell everybody everything about it, you want to coach everybody <laughs> who comes across yes. your path. And they go, yes. back off, bud, I'm not, I don't <laughs> want to do that. And then that's fine. So find a way of making it really practical, give a lived experience and get the, the, the peers to talk to each other about that lived experience. And then when you've had that experience and when you've got that bit of, you've done that bit of research and data gathering, then you are a more informed buyer so that when you do decide that you want to bring a coach in, mm know the kind of things that you're going to be evaluating that coach against and Mm -hmm. you know and I'm going on record as saying this you know just because a coach has a quote coaching qualification just because they're accredited with a coaching body that does not necessarily mean they are the right coach for you you have to experience them you have to understand what's their approach to coaching what are what's what are the things that they do when they coach? How have, how have they coach? What tools do they use? How do they work with you as a client? You know, loads of questions around what do they actually do? What are the, what are the behaviors? What are the um, approaches they take? That's what you want to know. And obviously, if they've got qualifications, and, and that's obviously you're looking for that, but don't base the decision on that. Base it on having done a bit of research and experience yourself and then you know what you're looking for in that coach because again it goes back to context is the coach or coaches are they right for this particular context and they may or may not be and you may have to use different coaches in different contexts so it's about being open to all of those questions and being open to doing a bit of the hard yards on getting your your ducks in a row before you go down the route yeah super i i suppose the um the sports analog is very useful once again um the great even the the even some of like the great boxers for example may have the same coach for years and years and then they say i've got a very unusual opponent coming up i need a different coach for this particular fixture um which is to say nothing of the fact that they don't use that coach for strength and conditioning nutrition stamina that coach is strictly you know footwork and handwork um, yep. And so they have this constellation, this retinue of different folks that are are there to basically help pull the whole program together. Happens to be an individual athlete, but a program. Yeah. Yeah. So the, there's a phrase, and I don't know if you use it in Canada, horses for horses. <laughs> Say it again. To, horses for courses. You need to know, yes. where, you know, what am I going to be using you for? How am I going to work with you? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I love I love two things that you said there. One one was start small and uh, be really practical. I think that will break the ice for a number of uh, organizations for whom it it just feels like uh, a big leap of faith. Yeah, which it is because you've got no evidence to base it on. You know, I'm all for looking at evidence. What's the evidence? Get some evidence before you do anything. Yeah. Do you mind if I just do a, just do a little bit of picking straight off of? Um, this list of six questions. I really like this one. And I, I just wonder if you can pick up from it. How can we gain a better understanding of our thinking? Yeah. So, so Ro, I think, you know, that the, you, you know, the, the bank of six questions that I'm drawing from, it's from your. Wait, can you um, tell me which your, page it is? <laughs> book, it's, it's from your book release. I can, I can show you on my, I can show you on my cheat, cheat sheet right here. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I'm I'm glad I squeezed that in because the auto blur on the background usually blurs out everything except for a human face, but we got it there. So, you've you've got these, you've got these questions here, um, teams, the key questions, and one of them 
that I wouldn't mind just sort of hearing more for why it's a key question and then how you handle. How can we gain a better understanding of our thinking? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that question for me is really crucial. Again, it goes back to the process of coaching that when we're coaching a team, in fact, when we're coaching one-on-one -on -one as well, we do, a, well, I do a timeout because I like to inject a bit of humor as well into the way I work with teams. So we do a timeout um, and it could be a question simple, what, what are you noticing about what's happening in the team right now? And then the team will tell you their lived experience of what, what is happening in the team at that moment. And that then provides a jumping off point for the next question. And in fact, it could be that one of the team members then asks a question based on what they've actually heard. So that ability to think and reflect is really important because coaching is all about learning and it's all about unlearning. So right. you mentioned a couple of comments back about getting in your own track and, and not seeing things from a different perspective. So what we're also asking the team to do is to unlearn behaviors that maybe haven't served them well in the past or maybe won't serve them well in the future. And that unlearning process can be very uncomfortable because, you know, you're automatically going back to your routines and then you go, oh, I've got to stop. So practicing that pause in, you know, mm -hmm. what we call pattern interrupt, practicing that um, means that the team starts to think and become more reflective automatically um, and not just do things because that's always the way that they've done things. So that thinking question is really important and you never know what the team is going to say <laughs> because they will tell you what's going on and I, that's what I love about asking questions because it opens a door of possibility for somebody to walk through and then you know you never know if you're going to walk into a garden if it's going to be a seascape or a, a mountain you never know where that door will take you um, so mm -hmm. and it's it's yeah the power of questions amazing can you take me back to the name that you referenced, Snowden? Dave Snowden. Oh, Dave Snowden. Yes, Kinevan, which is spelled C-Y-N-E-F for Freddy, I-N. It's a Welsh word, which means place of multiple belongings. And he, he chose that word because it reflects the decision-making framework that he developed, um, which looks, and he's, he's developed it further since then. So it's very sophisticated model it looks fairly straightforward when you look at it drawn it's actually very sophisticated and it's based on you know there will be times when decision making is is clear because everybody's done it before it's it's a known there will be mm -hmm. times when decision making is complicated um, because you need a degree of expertise there will be times when it's complex because um, you know it, there are there's no co obvious cause and effect and there will be times when it's chaotic, for example, in COVID, when nobody in our lived experience had gone through a pandemic. So, you know, chaos ensues because you don't know what to do. What's what's the next obvious first step that we need to take? We don't know. So you're constantly experimenting to work out what works and what doesn't. And then he since added, and there's also in the middle where that place of not knowing um, where you are, <laughs> it's like, I don't know. And then he's added a few more concepts within the framework but that's a basic framework mm. um, and it's something that I keep in the back of my head when I'm working with clients whether it's coaching training consulting whatever it is you know is this something that we do know something about it's really clear because if it is the decision should be no-brainer um, versus oh no chaos and, and did I get you right that part of his um, recommended course of action is when when you have two teams that are at odds you consider them engaging in an aligned piece of work yeah yeah and I, I can't remember what there's a tool that he he talks about and I can't remember if it's trioptocon or um triads something triads I can't remember the exact name I apologize but if you go on to the kenevin.io um wiki page all of the stuff is on there he is so generous with the the resources that he offers um, and Great. all of the information is on there. So I would definitely recommend for your viewers to go and check that out and listen to podcasts. He's very academic. Um, he's an amazing brain and I love listening to him. I've, I've 
been on so many of his webinars and talks and I've interviewed him. Um, so, and yeah, definitely, if you're working in the team coaching space, if you're working in organizations, you need to understand what complex adaptive systems are about and how complexity works in both organizations and just society at large. Um, and that's, to be honest, that's why I included also a section on um, biases and heuristics and cognitive um, patterns in the book, because we yep. need to understand when those things might be coming into play as well and help the team understand that this is the way the brain works. Don't sweat it. It's absolutely natural. Um, what we're trying to do is work out ways that we can work with the brain rather than against the brain without getting yeah. into the nitty gritties of too much sciencey stuff which you don't need to know you just need to know some practical tools that will help you navigate the complexity of the brain and complexity of how we we operate in in social systems well i was uh that that is an awesome double click so we're going to chase that up we're going to check that out and um if it's okay with you maybe we'll add links to that when we post course, this yeah. conversation and then yeah. people can, uh, I realize that's not your material, but we'll just do it as sort of extra. Yeah. Absolutely. And I apologize, Dave, if I've misrepresented the Kinevan framework in any way, you, you <laughs> have to dive out of your expertise and knowledge and absolute mastery of intellect. So uh, yes, <laughs> please do include that. I'm very happy to recommend um, Dave and, and his, his organization. This, this, uh, I w there's a connection there though that I made with how can we gain a better understanding of our thinking, which is one of your prompt questions. Uh, the, the idea of, of taking action as a way to see how you think, I think it's quite profound. So if you want to know how you think, reflecting and talking about how you think is maybe not so good as just, just being able to basically say, well, roll the, roll the tape and I'm just going to go behave like an athlete you know I'm going to do what I do I'll play the sport I play mm. yeah. and then let's yeah. see um and I I think there's something quite profound about that it, it's also it's also another thing that's been reflected in in um the classics is uh the connection between action and belief um you know do, do your beliefs drive your actions or or the other way around mm -hmm. I think it's reasonably well established now that the answer is yes Mm -hmm. uh they both do yeah um but yep. when but but there's something maybe profound in that for for teams as well mm. which is that um we we you know we're configured together not to hang around and like think thoughts together but usually to undertake pretty pretty execution oriented actions mm -hmm. um so if you want to uh, you know this question of yours how can we gain a better understanding of our thinking it seems to be that praxis, you know, watching, what do you literally do? What happens? How do you encounter one another? What, how, do, how do you get work done? And what happens in, in the cut and thrust of getting work done is a pretty profound lesson. Yep. Because unless you know, become aware of what, what you're doing, you can't change anything. So if you know that you have a particular pattern of working in, in the team and that's you automatically go into that then that's what's going to happen when you're working together and you therefore need to work out well what do we need to do differently how can we do mm. something differently and don't try and don't try and boil the ocean do small things often and over time that will make a difference and you know I go to the gym and so I and I'm a musician so I understand that if you practice one bar of music often and often um, for 10 minutes a day you're going to get better at it it's just obvious <laughs> what do you what do you play um well I used I play the piano and I play the violin but uh, my main instrument now is my voice so I do sing um super uh, yeah super I won't force you to give us a couple of bars but what what is the is there a genre that you um that you uh, prefer yeah, so I'm classically trained and I love Baroque music. Baroque and Renaissance music are probably my favorite um, forms of music. So, wow, yeah. what, a, what, a, what a discipline. There's the classics coming back again too. Exactly. I mean, not that, that's, exactly. not that that's Greek and Roman, but um, <laughs> there's a thread that runs all the way to the modern that's, day through there too. Yeah, yeah. Ro, uh, but the time vanished. Can the, uh, the last question, uh, the last question always is, um, how do how do, how would you like people to find you? 
um, e either to engage you personally, which by the way happens frequently with the authors that we interview. Somebody wants to just, mm -hmm. as opposed to just read their books, they want to do some work with them. Either to do work with you, to find you, to read what you've written or uh, otherwise engage you. What What is your recommendation? So at the moment, what seems to be working really well is LinkedIn because everybody can find me on LinkedIn. So I would say, you know, direct message me on LinkedIn. I'm always, okay. I'm always delighted to hear how people are using the book, what they liked, what they didn't like, what worked, what didn't work. Um, so if they do read the book and want to give me some feedback and, and would even be willing to write a review, um, I'm always open to that. And if they want to have a chat about anything that we've discussed, then yeah, please contact me via LinkedIn. Okay. Good stuff. Bro, thanks very much. I'm Thank so glad you. I'm so glad we did it. Let's um really enjoyed it. Let's, really uh, enjoyed it. Yeah, good. Good. Okay, well, um it's it's Canadian evening. I'm gonna hand off the baton to you to uh, carry through the, the rest of the next day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, enjoy your evening and thank you very much. And I hope everybody's enjoyed listening to our conversation. Be well. Fantastic. Bye. Take care.